Wow, hey, <laughs> welcome to episode 30. And today I announced to show you all my secrets. Well, to be honest, I'm very sure I can't show you all my secrets because a two hours show is not long enough. <laughs> but there's a few, um, well, critical or substantial things on my sound and on my style that I can show you. And I thought we should have a little, um, yeah, go back in at my very beginnings and see how everything kind of uh, came along. Everything evolved in, in a way with my roots and then how I discovered certain things and how I developed my own style in a way. And of course, what kind of gear I was uh, using. And I've got my beautiful... Marshall Plexi here, which is a 50 watt. This is actually the amp that I used most of the time on all the records that I have recorded myself and a lot in the studio. And then there is the um, Triumph Mark II, which I used a lot uh, when I, yeah, in when I designed the amp, which started in when was it um, 1995, and I used it up until I had my M1. So yeah, we can go back in history and we can look at the current things. But the point is, maybe it's interesting to you guys to understand what I have done to find my style and tone. So you can maybe find your style and tone. And it might be different from mine, but some of the things that I discovered um, are interesting to look at. Um, and then it's up to you to take your decision what is best for your style and tone. And of course, if you do have any questions, feel free to go on the stream. Um, I can read the questions today and uh, I can answer so we can be very interactive. Okay, but before we do that, we had a little quiz going on. Who is the new guy at Blue Guitar? Hmm. We had a few guesses. Nobody knows. Um, it's somebody that maybe you guys all know. You guys all know. And uh, it's a guy that is known. So we have a little video. And um, yeah, maybe we watch that little video <laughs> and see what you think. I can't believe this guy. It's going to blue guitar. How bad for the people that he left behind, but so good for blue guitar. That is one lucky company. He is so handsome, uh, handsome and strong. And, and whenever we've worked together, it resulted in masterpieces. Hello fellow guitar geeks, my name is Andy Ferris and Rich and I have been working together in some kind of capacity for the past few years. Uh, my face always lights up when I see Rich at a trade show or at some kind of guitar event where we get to hang out. He's always fun to be around, he knows his stuff, he's got really wonderfully curly hair and um, he's my friend. So Thomas and all the rest of the guys at Blue Guitar, you're very lucky to have him. And everybody watching this, I hope that you get to see the fruits of Rich's work very, very soon. And Rich, well done. Nice to see you uh, working hard. I'll see you soon, mate. Bye-bye. I'm not sure what about the, the days back in, in the UK in, um, in Garford with uh, uh, Leeds where JHS, this kind of uh, UK distributor that uh, distributes Blue Guitar and Houston Kettner and the vintage guitars, you work for them? 
Yeah, I did. That was my first job in, in the music business, wow. so to speak. Um, yeah. I must have started in 2010 or something like that. Yeah. And I met you pretty soon afterwards, I think, yeah. because we, of course, were distribution partners for right. HK Audio yeah. and later Hughes and & Kettner Amps. Yeah. And we also did the vintage guitars. And of course, your name and the vintage guitar name is quite closely linked, yeah. let's say. Yeah. So I met you there and you, you didn't realize at first that I could speak German and do other yeah. useful, interesting things maybe, but... <laughs> Over the course of working with you on the guitars and stuff like that, we realized that, yeah, it was quite, yeah. it worked pretty well. Yeah. So your German speaking, where does it come from? Did you learn it at school? No. I learned it from a lady. From your lady. Okay. Yeah. So learn, guys. The best way to learn a foreign language is get a lady or marry. You are married? Yeah. Okay. So do it properly. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good way to, to, to pick up foreign languages. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, I mean, we, we've been in contact, you know, occasionally over the, you know, over the, all these years. And then um, when I started Blue Guitar, I had somebody to translate the instruction manual, which is over there. Can you pass me the one yeah. under the, yeah, this yeah. one? The beautiful book. So this was kind of the English part, which is the second part of the book, is um, Richard's translation. Um, myself and, well, some people that helped me a bit, but mainly myself, um, did these 50 pages. <laughs> <laughs> and you did um, a beautiful job on translating the rest and of I it. I did the rest, yeah. yeah. So, so I knew the AMP one pretty well, right? from the start. Yeah. And then you moved over to Germany mm -hmm. at that time because your lady comes from Stuttgart area, right? Tübingen, yeah. Tübingen. Baden-Württemberg, yeah. Baden-Württemberg, okay. So all people from Baden-Württemberg, okay, he's been to Baden-Württemberg. Um, and um, then you asked me, yeah, what about getting a job here in Germany? And there were a few options and one was um, uh, yeah, very far from where we are now. Yeah. And the other company was uh, Hughes and Kettner, and I said, you know, I just left Hughes and Kettner, but you know what? Why not? You, you, uh, yeah, you know, it's good enough. Go there. I've <laughs> been there long enough to tell you that people are not mean. It, you know, it's so. Um, yeah. Then, then you moved actually kind of into this area where we are now. Yeah. And uh, you worked for them how many years? Six and a half. Six and a half, so yeah. So quite a long time. Well, I did 27. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that, that's, a, that's a long time. <laughs> that's a bit longer, yeah. But anyway, six and a half years in the industry is already um, uh, is a serious uh, life in, in a company. Yeah. And so, and I'm f I, I know, well, because we know each other anyway. And, you know, the whole music industry scene is so small. So when every guy thinks... You know, of course, we are um, a little bit confidential about super high stuff, uh, like details. But in the end, you know, we all, it's such a small industry and we are all connected anyhow. So it's, um, you know, we meet at airports, at trade shows, we have beers together. And this goes in any company, you know. So, you know, we are basically all friends anyhow. And even our competition is never a competition is kind of a mitbewerber yeah. in german and uh, so you know and if it's 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 always fun to meet people and you know um, everybody is doing his thing and uh, yeah so anyway finally um, i was hunting you for a while <laughs> <laughs> it's been, yeah, it's been quite a few years that we've been kind of meeting each other, bumping into each other, and you've been saying, hey, how about yeah. thinking about doing this, and yeah. I'm still here. And yeah, and, and the reason for, 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 um, for me being a boss of a company, hiring Rich now, is I know how good he is in, in well, first in the context with all the YouTubers because we kind of met at the YouTubers events mm -hmm. and you've been there first. So you, so I came there like, you know, uh, blank and, and, and you've been there already. So, um, but anyway, I'm, I've, I've done my thing just by myself already, but we, we met at Hennings, we met at, uh, Toman and wherever. I, I mean, basically, um, this is a scene by itself yeah. that, that we now also, um, uh, well, both have been 
uh, attending. And, and then, um, but, but the other thing is, um, I know you have a passion for detail. And I know the, the, the way you write things is, you have a certain style. And maybe this is, comes from your well, character or musical background. But um, I've worked with other people to translate stuff, other people uh, to, to do what kind of posts and, and stuff like this, marketing. And your style was, I, like, I always liked your style. So, you know, and that's, that's so important. I mean, besides all the skills, I think a certain style is, um, for me, is, 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 is so important with a brand and what I do. Because at one point I decided to go my way and I wanted to have a small team. And so, I mean, we now present you rich and there won't be 30 other people, <laughs> I promise you. So this is a very, very um, special thing to present a new guy besides Kai Sonhalter and Julian, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the thing is, um, yeah, your style and um, your experience and all the, the, the stuff that we already did told me, you know, we need Rich. And now the time is here, now you're here, super cool. Yeah, and, and now you've said all that on video, so now I have to perform or you can say, okay, <laughs> we'll see you later. <laughs> Yeah, sure, Perfect. but uh, yeah, but yeah. It, you know how it is. Uh, um, if if you know somebody for a while, I'm very very sure that uh, we we get somewhere. Yeah, and um, getting somewhere. Hey, get a guitar. Uh, let's let's play a, a few notes. Just okie dokie. Um, usually, I don't know how many times you've been seen with a guitar in your hands. On not that many. Yeah, I often. Um, I often thought about playing on the Hughes and Kettner channel, but I stepped back from it because I think that you were the figurehead for that brand on YouTube as well for so yeah. long, and you're the Strat King of Europe. And as you guys are about to see, I'm sort of the opposite of that when it comes to <laughs> guitar playing. I'm not the best. I, I, I grew up at a time when I think guitar heroes were sort of dead. Ah, yeah. So when I was kind of first getting into good music in the mid-90s, it was about as a songwriting. Kid, you know, Nirvana had come out and killed off hair metal mm -hmm. and the guitar heroes and stuff like that so all you needed was three or four chords and you could do everything you wanted to do and unfortunately i never really learned any more than that but no. i can play those three or four chords pretty well by now so okay so that's all right okay so you do the lead stuff i do the lead I'll do stuff. Some rhythm and, and it might work okay cool yeah um uh, whatever play something play something and uh, whatever it is I, I go for it what should we do something sort of clean and laid back or something a bit rocky or Let's start clean and then get rocky. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Yep. You go.
cool. Yeah, um, yeah nice, nice, nice. So um, today, I promised people to explain a little bit about my secrets. Yes. And uh, I was actually using already a few of my secrets. You were, yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. How shall we start the whole thing? Well, maybe you want to kind of go back a little bit to the start and sort of we'll start from your earliest secrets, your earliest tonal recipes and sort of build from there maybe. Okay. Maybe that would work. I, I, I'll try, I'll try. So this, maybe you can see that, which camera is this, this one or this one? This was my first band. It's called Symbiose. <laughs> so this was a band um, from school with all, you know, we had a, yeah, we had a bass player. We had, we had too many guys, actually. We started as a three-piece and then we ended up four or six-piece, whatever you can see. Um, in the last episode, I had a, a picture from Omasheim, maybe you remember, which was a, uh, which is a little village here. And we played uh, one of those town halls. Uh, actually, we had a crowd even at the, at the very, very beginning. Uh -huh. um, so do I have... And this was back when you were still a school kid, basically? Yeah, this yeah. was me, 80, maybe 84. And um, I have no idea. Um, I found something... Yeah, Symbiose, <laughs> Knipser Concert, Knipser Concert, that's a Knipser Concert. It's actually not the CD I was looking for, but let's try. Um, I hope this thing is, is okay, it's number six. Let's see what this, this is. This, what, these were the days where I had my Mesa Boogie MK2B, which was already modified. <laughs> wow. Anyway, so you can imagine this was my school band blo yeah. playing blues and all kinds of music. And the people loved it already. Yeah, because we play that for our school friends. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, let me see if I find a, uh, a thing where I solo, because that's kind of interesting mm. to me to see what I played back then. And what I play back now, let, let, let's, let's try, I, I will forward, hoping that... <laughs> ah, piano solo, nobody needs that one. <laughs> there we go. I think I tried to be a guitar hero back then. Yeah, how was it for you back then? Because it takes it takes a certain kind of attitude and 
maybe even ego, to yes, want to do that. Especially when you don't have the same kind of skills that you have now. I mean, you were already pretty damn good. Yeah. It sounded, it sounded good. It sounded well, really good. Sometimes I listen to that old stuff and I think, I haven't learned a new lick in the last 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> Just playing it faster now. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. But, but sometimes I even play, played really fast back then. Yeah. Um, But did you did you always want to be doing that kind of lead playing? You never wanted to sit like me at the back or like Malcolm Young and just holding down a rhythm or anything like that? I think I was a solo guitar player from day one. Yeah. I started on the acoustic for a week, then I got fed with it, fed up with it, and then I, I bought an electric, I, I built myself my first overdrive pedal, and then and then I, you know. I became a solo guitar player. Yeah. I mean, you can tell, you know, I mean, we have some other, uh, or we had some other songs with rhythm guitars as well, but it, it, it's already there, like from, from the very, very beginning. And a deep love of blues right from the start as well. Yeah, I mean, because I was loving um, the Rolling Stones, Richie Blackmore and all that kind of um, roots, blues-based music, even though in those days, um, hair metal was the, the cool thing, but when you look at my haircut, it <laughs> it is uh, yeah. it is not hair metal. No, you know? not quite. <laughs> Our keyboard player had had the most hair. <laughs> um, yeah, but when you listen to the tone in, in back in the day, these days, it was the a tone that was a bit more uh, saxophone like, more mid range yeah. and um, I noticed that. That is okay, but the more I I started to to record things in the studio because you know this was me. Ah, wow! This was 1983. 1983. Yeah. Wow. So and um, recorded live in Oberwürzbach. <laughs> that's that's here the close neighborhood. Anyway, um, so so this band. And, and my tone in this band was, we had a saxophone player and it was kind of more saxophone-like. Mm. And then I discovered later on that I wanted to have a bigger tone. And I had a band, a three-piece band called Trash with Gully, who is actually nowadays um, the guy who is in my, who, he's back in, in my life with the rock anarchy. So... This, the photo from back in the days is killer. <laughs> um, and w we, we had a cover, that this was kind of a, a cover three-piece band, and I discovered that I wanted to have more low-end. Yep. And the Mesa wasn't doing that. Yep. And I got into Jimi Hendrix, and then I learned I need an amp that has more oomph. Yep. And now I can show you If I plug in here and at this point were you already playing a strat? Yeah. Yeah. All my recordings were It's always been a strat. Yeah. Okay. Is I mean I had a Les Paul but I never touched it. Yeah. Uh, um this yeah, so so this was um let me see if I can get this going. Ah, can you switch on the, the Marshall? down and this should be uh, oh. just unplug the, the the input cable to double check if it's this one yeah yeah okay okay it's, it's all good it's the marshal okay the, you know so guys this is the proof we we're having a real marshal here <laughs> in in the house and this is a i think 69 um, which is not having the real um, uh, uh, plexi front panel anymore, but this was my main amp and it's still killer. I explain you why. So I'm using the switching system, but now this is going direct from the guitar into the Marshall input. Um, okay, sorry for the scratchy pot here. I will clean this for the next episode. <laughs> um, so what when you look at the settings you can see volume one and two is full <coughs> tilt and then i do the bridge kind of thing so where i combine both channels mm -hmm. 
and then um, the rest is pretty much um, mids or up, treble, up, bass, somewhere, and a little bit of everything, not too, not too much treble. So, and this is a cranked Marshall, so now this is the real deal, everything on 10, and this is what you get. So, when you compare this with... That tone, compared to my first tone, is like, I, I would describe it like one octave lower. Like the whole thing is shifted to be more masculine and... Uh, and this is, you know, you can already hear the kind of Jimi Hendrixy, um, you know... Uh, This kind of overdrive was a very essential point for me and um, I was always trying to get a huge sound because the experience for my Mesa Boogie at the beginning was it's like a telephone and trying to be a guitar hero with a telephone, you need a big band with keyboards and everything. Yeah. But in the three-piece band that I had with Gully, was it sounded not big enough. I, I I I tried different M's, and in the end, I ended up you know with something big like this. Yeah. Yeah. So and this is, you know, this is the thing everybody talks about. It's a plexi on full. This is using my silence cabinet here if we would open that you know hello neighbors <laughs> hello Saarbrücken we, it is fucking loud so and um, so and the next thing is I'm using the volume the pickups like Richie Blackmore and that's that's the starting point so, and by the way, I can switch back. one and it's even more masculine yeah <laughs> okay so your first tonal secret then yeah was to get a plexi yeah and turn it all the way up yeah and that's what is the foundation of what I'm doing and yeah. then um, you know this is a 50 watt plexi and this is more like a hundred watt and the hundred watt is a bit bigger so but you can hear the it's so similar it, it is that word and you can hear yeah, that's me. So I'm still on the same track. Yeah. So the next thing I discovered were, you know, a little bit effects here. So, you know, there, there, were, there were kind of um, things. Ah, before we go into effects and stuff, um, well, let, me, let me show. Back in the days, being a Richie Blackmore fan, I discovered a couple of things. So... Um, picks. So these are, this is a real Richie Blackmore pick. Can we show this? Yeah. The, so, and this is the shape. Ugh, I lost it. It's gone forever. Yeah. It's really gone. Yep, it really okay. is. Yep. <laughs> I will find it later. But okay, it is, it is, 
that shape because this is the same uh, this camera now or this camera <laughs> so it is the the home plate pick or whatever we call it um, yeah so and I have been using this pick in different materials so the first thing is this is the so that's that's the pick and I grew on up on this pick then how, how did you first get this pick into your possession? Was it purely because you saw Richie Blackmore and you needed to get yeah. what he had? Yeah. Okay. It's it's the typical, he's my hero kind of thing. Whatever he was playing, I need to have, which was, of course, the strut, which I already had. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it was that magic pick. Yeah. And then I was copying that, that pick for myself. And I found out that the materials are super important. The mm -hmm. shape is one. So this is a real metal pick, mm -hmm. different materials like real metal okay this is using abs um, it's a plastic it's a name for a plastic abs mm -hmm. and this is this is pme <laughs> another thing some dentists used uh, so. see it's warmer yeah what kind of pick is this? This is my Jim Dunlop Jazz 3. And it sounds... Which many of you... I mean, I can play with the pick. Yeah. Um, hold it. I play... Different tone. I'm not changing anything. And especially against the metal one, yeah. the attack is... So, you know, that's... It's a different tone. Yeah. And maybe you like it, maybe you prefer yours or whatever, but this is another essential component for, for the tone and your phrasing. Yeah. And this pick also made me play in a different way because of this triangle thing on top. Mm -hmm. You know, there is this um, downward pit slang, uh, uh, pick slanting thing. Uh, I don't know if some camera can... So it's like... And I found a, a position where I can just... Sort of you know, so So this is a Richie kind of thing. I'm not even sure if he does it that way, but yeah. I, you know, as long as you believe it's it's the way he does it, it works. Yeah. So the pick is so important, and uh, yeah, this is a weird pick which is totally out of fashion. We still got some of these in our shop for those th people that want to try that kind of. Uh, some people love them, other people don't like them, but it's it's something yeah you can try out. Does any company still manufacture these picks? Not anymore. No? Dunlop used to do them mm. a while, but then after a while, this is why I made them myself. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't buy them anymore. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Okay, the next thing is this capacitor. Um, which is a silver mica capacitor. Um, the silver mica is the type, and this is um, 
180 to 250 picofarads. That's the value that I use on my volume pot. And this gives me this kind of better cleaning up. So when I, I simply show you. Here, you can hold this for a sec. And this is a killer, all original, except for the frets, but I bought it with original frets, 1964 Stratocaster. One owner I know him personally. So, with original freeway switch, okay. And now, what happens is, uh, you know, when I crank the, the pickups, it's pretty similar. But when I go down, it's very warm. Yep. So, swap guitars mm -hmm. uh, this yep. way. <laughs> okay, so this one, you know, here, now using the this kind of extra clarity. Yeah, it retains all of the high end as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's very different. Yeah, and that's a cheesy little component. It's very easy. You simply bridge, the, the, the pot has like three uh, solder joints. One is ground. It's directly connected to, you know, to the, uh, to what is it called? The, the cover of the pot. Mm -hmm. So this one is usually kind of bent that way and directly connected. And the other two, one is the input, the other one is the output, and you put this between input and output. And what happens is the, 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 the less volume there is, the more will be bypassed for, uh, with this capacitor. Mm -hmm. So this kind of gets the high frequencies across and when it's all the way up, it's bypassed and it's the same. Mm -hmm. But the, the further down you get the volume, the more highs you get. So am I right in saying this is what we refer to as a treble bleed mod? Yes, yep. that's, okay. that's the treble bleed mod. Okay, so that's that's your tonal secret number three. Yeah. The treble and, bleed mod. Yeah, and the treble bleed mod, um, there are people that have a, a resistor in parallel to make the, uh, the, the, the effect less dramatic, blah, blah, blah. I go all the way. I just have a capacitor done. Yeah. Okay. I do understand why people are, you know, a bit delicate about it and, and not use too high values and stuff like this. But I choose the value from 180 to 250 picofarads depending on the guitar. So I have several of these and then try out, ah, oh, this one needs a bit extra spice and the next one the, 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 the smaller value is fine. Is this a modification that you would recommend that your fans, the people watching this, can they do this themselves or should they take it, their guitar to a tech to get it done or should they experiment? Um, well, if you ever have done a soldering job on your guitar successfully, you can do that Be because this is not taking any of the other contacts away. This is just additionally bridging in and output on this volume port. It's a fairly easy job. Yeah. Uh, and of course, if you were not feeling secure doing that, go and see a tech because, you know, well, if, if some people are not tech, technical people, <laughs> yes. which, which is fair enough, you know, maybe they're great cooks, which I'm not, <laughs> but, but, you know, um, but if, if, if you know how to take a guitar apart and how to do a proper solder joint, that's, you can do that. It's it's an easy one. Yeah. And it's not too complicated because you have, uh, you know, only to add this component. And what made you realize that you needed this with your Strat? Was there a point where you maybe yeah. played different guitars that retained that clarity that you wanted? Or I, well, well, I heard this one. <laughs> When I heard this kind of thing from Richie Blackmore, I wanted that. But actually, he's even not doing that. 
he is using the Range Master Treble Booster uh -huh. that, that does the job. But back in those days, I thought it was the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I, I kind of, I, I, I've done the, the, the modification and I'm, I was stuck there. Why? Because the Range Master Treble Blue, uh, Booster is a beautiful device, but it has so much color of its own. Mm. I mean, Brian May uses it, and, and it, 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 it's something magic, I love it, but it's, I already started this, giving me the same effects with a standard amp, and I had more character of my own already. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of, I adapted a principle, getting more treble, and um, made it my own. Yeah. Maybe by not knowing. And that's one of the other secrets is um, whatever works for you, you are the master. Don't be shy. Just go for it. If you, if you like something, whatever it is, it is your taste. It's your style. Yeah, that's a very important thing always that comes up in guitar-based discussions. Everyone knows that you have a great tone, but actually... Tone is in the ear of the beholder. So what sounds good to you might not sound good to me. Yeah, Trust me, you sound good to me. <laughs> and what sounds good to me might not sound good to you. So if you guys out there are kind of thinking, oh, I'll never get the sound Thomas has. Well, you don't have to aspire to get exactly his sound. I would say get a sound that you love. And if your ears say this sounds great, then it does. Simple yeah. as. Yeah, yeah. And uh, all great guys, all the guys that, that have done their own they found their own tone. They took these decisions. And, and this is why I wanted to, to talk about this kind of things. Even when I didn't know stuff, my decision created my tone. Yep. So, and um, today we have so many options. Back in the days, there were fewer options. Maybe it was good, maybe not. Um, what I'm saying is my heroes um, inspired me in a way that I was digging into listening to the, their sounds, trying to copy them, found solutions, some were, worked better, some I, I played for a while, then, then came back, then did something else. That's a try and error thing. And then kind of, but the tone that I had in my head, um, or my tone I always had in my head. That's funny, I knew what I wanted. And there's some people out there that don't know what they want. And then you can't help them. And it's like, if they like something, okay, that's good enough. But I always was complaining about, even when I had a, the greatest tone for other people, you, you go, oh man, you sound killer. I say, yeah, you know, it can be better. I can prove you because here comes my next ingredients. Okay, back with the... Uh, Maxi on full, treble bleed. Mm -hmm. The next thing is the reflex. It could be any other tube-like boost as well. But listen what happens to a plexi. It doesn't matter if the original or any of these, uh, of the M1 or whatever. I show you. And add a boost, doing my thing with a volume control. So this is the tube stage only. Ah, it's not. Stupid me, I should plug in here. <laughs> uh, no, I proved that it works on everything, which means this goes in here, and this one goes in here. So I can now use the reflex, and now I'm on the amp one, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is my... Now with the boost. The tone gets even bigger. Yeah. And it's still, the clarity is still there. Okay. And I was always looking for getting my tone bigger because the Strat has this kind of high res register and it's like um, I, I, I always try to, to make 
the Strat sound like Les Paul <laughs> with with its Stratocaster qualities, but getting in this kind of range of Les Paul. Yeah. So that's that's kind of my my cup of tea. Yeah. So here. <laughs> Without. You know, some people say, you're not a man if you can't play a plexi. Well, I do play a plexi on full, and I actually did this in pubs. So, this was even before we had power soaks, which means... Uh -huh. Everyone uh, is deaf, who you played for back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. And I was using even, um, you know, the cases from the drums or they, yeah. they had like bags that I was kind of using gaffer tape in front of my 4x12 to, to kind of reduce the volume. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was um, a strange. So, but here again, without and with the boost. And it makes my guitar sound bigger and more expensive, I believe. interesting to say that you're not using the reflex in a way that most people would buy the pedal. Most people would know it as a tube-powered reverb and delay pedal. Yeah, um, and this is a rip of or is a copy of the original tube Echoplex. Mm -hmm. Most people these days know the EP3 booster. Yeah. And this is the Echoplex version 3, which was a transistor kind of thing. It also has kind of a thickening element to it but this the all early ones have an even thicker sound yeah which is too much for a Les Paul but it's for my kind of skinny strat it's the beefiest thing ever <laughs> and now I can even have a, a touch more gain if I want to and get it creamier so you know, then I go all the way just for fun <laughs> No, kind of nice. So, and since I was playing that this thing with that Marshall in front of that Marshall, because the Marshall didn't have an effects loop, I learned how to play an echo in front of an overdriven amp. Mm -hmm. Most people miss that. Mm -hmm. And this is my secret number... I think we're on four, four. right now. So secret okay. number four is the reflex pedal as a boost yeah. in the front of the amp because yeah. you had no effects loop yeah. to, to run it through. Yeah. Okay. And now engaging the delay. expensive right it. yeah it does and the thing that you can hear is when the repeats come again and again the, the level drops and so the repeats are cleaner you know because less level will have less saturation on the amplifier and that's totally different from an amp that is overdriven yeah. and then kind of repeated um, with a delay and effects loop yeah and that's a magic you have to be super careful with it but this is like you know i go on two on that guitar have the volume all the way up okay yeah. we are noisy now mm -hmm. but
I use on stage is sometimes a dramatic effect. I'm switching in and out the, the echo. Mm -hmm. So I play... Maybe more reap. And I just have it for a few notes. Yeah. And the other thing is, when I want the space chords, I increase the volume. Mm -hmm. So when you see videos of me diving to my pedal board, it's usually that control. Uh -huh. huh? oh. And I'm using this vintage factor all the way up, which is the wobbly effect. Yeah, okay. That's Without the wobbly effect, it sounds like this. Mm -hmm. The magic is disappeared. Yeah. 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 So that's that's the secret. Ah, and by the way, we can do the same. I wanted to say about the reflex end, this is going to be a secret that not many people watching this can achieve because the reflex is no longer produced, obviously. It's not easy to find either. And we did have a question from Randy Smith who says, Hello, Thomas. Hey. He has a question. Hey. Yeah, is there a way to get the sound of the reflex in a smaller size format? Because I don't know if you guys can see the reflex there, but it's actually huge. It's yeah. bigger than the Amp 1 as well. Yeah. <laughs> I, it probably has a really annoying power supply too. Well, yeah. Am I right? So it's yeah. not practical. So as Randy said, is there a more modern pedal in a smaller format that you would recommend? I'm totally honest. I tried everything and there is none. That's, sorry, so sorry, Randy. If Randy, <laughs> this is this is the, the truth. If you go on the all the way level, which is like, uh, where are we? Uh, I'm on the. I show you what the magic about this thing is. It's the modulation. The modulation has such a... I remember when I designed this pedal with Bernd Schneider at Jusen Kettner back in the days, in the 90s, whenever. We, we analyzed the wobbling of this original tube tape echo, the echoplex. Yeah. And it was so old and it was so fucked up that, you know, you know, the tape was sliding around and got stuck. And, and this is the magic. And every pedal on the market has a very repetitive pattern in a way. It's like, and it's not the same. And this is what makes the sound so big. Oh. Yeah, it, there are some pedals that do similar stuff. I think, uh, what's the name? Belly Pock. I bought that one from Belly Pock, uh, some American. It's a, a standard size pedal, yep. pretty good. Mm. But it's all pretty good, but it's not. I still use that pedal and I would have changed it um, if I found anything that would do the same thing. Have you ever tried any of the super delays like the Strymon or, you know, the new Strymon, the Volante maybe? Yeah. Um, this has I, all the different to... tape delay controls on it, wow and flutter and all sorts. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there was the the, um, the earlier one, which was at uh, the Kapstan, El Kapstan. El Capistan, yeah. Capistan, yeah. Um, I tried that one. It, it's getting there somehow. Mm. Uh, I was always missing something. Yeah. Anyway, so um, try those. Um, and the other day, I even tried a, an old, a, a, a real tape echo. We had mm. it here on the show as well. Um, what's the one? The black one. Um, uh, Binson, maybe? Uh, no, Binson, uh, Binson is new. Um, who makes a replica of the uh, um, American brand? Makes also vibes. It's a. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, I will take you another time. I take. Big. You know this nice little. F full tone. Full tone. Full it's, tone. Yeah, okay. full, full tone. So, and that's a true tube tape echo. Mm -hmm. It is 
it is a well, it is a copy of the original one, of that one that yeah. we also had. But the problem about that tape pack, okay, echo, it, it is in too good condition. And this vintage factor actually emulates the really old Echoplex. So the full tone is like, kind of like here. <laughs> and it, it's missing 30 years of abuse. <laughs> and that's the magic here. Yeah. So yeah. what you're saying is at the moment, actually, if you want 100%, you've got to get a reflex. Yeah. Otherwise, or, there is a gap in the market and we wait for yeah. something which could replicate this I, I'm sound. sure in a future product, which might be called the MX, will have something like that well, because maybe. I need it personally. <laughs> and it's a blue guitar product. So, you know, um, yeah. So this, um, we actually worked on this already. And um, this kind of modulation we already captured so there's a future for me with another setup even smaller than this <laughs> yeah um, so what else I have um, I have learned many many things when I was a session guy as well um, so when I looked at at the stuff that influenced me there's your pick by the way oh, thank you uh, um, I was going back in, 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 in history and looked at the stuff that I have done and then there was another band which is also influential on my tone which is that um, three-piece band, the German three-piece band called Dreist. Dreist is a, is a German word for drei means three and Dreist means kind of bold, a bit aggressive. Mm -hmm. So we were a, a, a bit aggressive three-piece band, <laughs> which um, um, I think in the early 90s was with original materials. I wrote lyrics and you can see my uh, my strats. Ah, I have to show to the audience. Ah, by the way, we can see a picture here when we opened up for Deep Purple and uh, we, so this is, you can see the tiny me in, at the end of the picture. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we played big stages and many small stages. And um, were you on vocals as well, or just playing guitar at that band? Uh, I was always doing backing vocals, but um, I'm a lousy singer. I never do leads. I hate to sing. That's my problem. Uh, but in a three piece, it's good to have somebody that opens his mouth w once in a while. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, but maybe, is there a picture? Uh, I tried to show it to this camera here. I don't know if you can see that in this corner. Anyway, this is me sitting in front of this amp on top of a 4x12 smoking. So this was, <laughs> this was the... Wait, you're smoking or the 4x12 is smoking? <laughs> I was smoking. Okay. Uh, but I quit smoking a couple of years mm. uh, ago. Okay. You know, you know how it is, you know, old school smoking shit. Um, but I was never really addicted. That's a good thing. One day I simply forgot to smoke because nobody smoked anymore. So I quit smoking by na nature because I forgot about to smoke. There's still, still some cigarettes in my, somewhere down and there. 10 years old, maybe. Yeah, I found some in the office on my first day, remember? Ah, yeah, yeah. In so my <laughs> desk, half a pack of cigarettes and some old papers, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, old, old crap. Anyway, so the three-piece band was important for me to kind of work in a setting where the guitar has to fill the whole space. Yes, know? exactly. When you don't have a rhythm guitarist, especially when you want to play lead stuff, you have a whole lot more of a sonic palette that you have to fill on your own. Yeah. So how did you do that? Well, how do I do that? I used I used the um, I used the just plexi, mm -hmm. and I cranked it as with the bridging. You know what? I put in the CD. I hope um, we don't get uh, the the stream um, <laughs> wh whatever it's called because it's my own music. Yeah, if your own band takes down your live stream, I'll yeah. be pretty disappointed. Let, let me see what's on, on, on the CD. Um, Can we find Dreist anywhere online? Is the music available to buy or to stream or Have a look. This, this CD is out of production. We have a live CD, which is actually um, maybe the better one. 
um, which came out later. Um, but just to, to give you an idea. Ah, and by the way, this is using the reflex as well. Um, let's see how this sounds. Is this doing anything? The CD player is so old, it doesn't have a display anymore. <laughs> I'll just like to say a quick hello to uh, Ben Granfeld. Ah, Ben's sure. watching the stream, and he said he just started watching from the beginning. Probably the best Strat tones he's ever heard, and he stood next to Thomas on stage yeah. for quite a few gigs now. He might be taller, but he says he feels smaller every time <laughs> he's next to you. Well, how do you think I feel, Ben, sitting next to him here playing and holding this 64 Strat? But, yeah. 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 Okay, back to Dreist. Yeah, back to Dreist. So this is the gym. Okay, it's uh, it's about the lyrics. Um, okay, let let me scroll forward for the solo because that's me. <laughs> um, I'm hearing different effects on your guitar here. Is yeah. Lots of is it phase or flange? What were you using there? It, it, it was a a, 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 a uni vibe kind of thing. Okay. And it's already using my favorite key, which is B minor. Mm. Uh, I, I found out with this. So here. So this is, I, I give a bit more. Blah blah blah, mm. um, but you but you hear this um, you hear this um, what is it? Now with the reflex. That's a physical way. I mean, if I, uh, you, I, I'm sure most guitar players would never get that energy going. And this is what I learned in the band Reist because it's, I mean it. You know, it's like, this is like, there is, n I, I give 150% behind every note, you mm -hmm. know? So that's, that's not. And then of course, top yeah yeah so but this is like you know this Marshall is like glowing it's nearly dying <laughs> it's like you know bam that so, 
So the tonal secret here is Energy. your attack. Yeah, it is the attack. your dynamics. It's the it is the attack, the dynamics, and using a, f a fluffy vintage sound, I make you play that sound, and you will probably not get a, a decent note out of it. Let, let's check it because, like, you know, I can almost guarantee it. <laughs> yeah, <go ahead. laughs> so here's a guitar. So. And maybe you use your pick, which is actually pretty Oops. good because it's more focused already. And then... Yeah. Sounds pretty good. It's all right. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm hitting it a lot harder than yeah. I normally would yeah. just to try and replicate yeah. you because yeah. I, could, I could feel and Boom. hear the acoustic sound of the yeah. guitar almost as loud as the monitors here. Yeah. I just hit those chords. <laughs> But yeah, this is this is not my thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. But cool. This is um, so. If if we go back to this kind of thing is like. You know, I try to get all the overtones from the guitar. Yeah. And it's like no prisoners. <laughs> and that's what I learned in this band. And then. Of course, you can expand the dynamic range of playing and uh, playing all these gigs with this band and having all these um, rehearsals kind of in front of public. That made me uh, a mature rock player. You know, I mean, I was, I had a certain level before. As, as we heard, you know, from a very early days, but I think I, I actually founded that band to get there. I, I wanted to have a band that I can do that kind of thing that needs, you know, that the, the name Dreist it didn't come from nowhere. It was about, okay, I mean it and I'm honest and I'm Dreist. I'm bold or whatever it's mean. I don't know the English word for it. No, I don't know. I don't know that word. I, maybe there is not even a, 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 a real equivalent for yeah. it. So if you, I mean, Dreist is somebody that does it and you, it's kind of, kind of a, a bit of respectful, but it's also a bit harsh. What is it? Brazen. Google Translate says brazen. I don't know the English word. Yeah, I mean, that, that's... What does it, Tell you. Brazen, it's like dreist. <laughs> no, brazen is like, yeah, someone who is kind of arrogant and they know that what they're doing yeah. might be a little bit too much or over the top, yeah. but they're going to do it anyway. Yeah. You know, they, they, they don't care that they are this person. Yeah. 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 So, so this kind of officially allowed us to go to the edge, you know? Yeah. So, uh -huh. th so this was this kind of influence. And you created this band in order to do that. Yeah. Were there any other guitar players who inspired you to do that? Or was that just like the evolution of where you were before, the, the Blackmore influence, the other tonal secrets that you already had? How did you get to that phase? Yeah, I, I, I think it, it was a, a combination of uh, a little bit... Uh, uh, I met Pete, the singer, um, who became a bass player for that band because I always turn guitar players, he is original guitar player, into bass players. <laughs> I did the same thing with Gulli for, for the rock anarchy thing, which, uh, but anyway, um, so he, he was in a, in, a, in a very interesting or critical uh, phase in his life. His wife committed suicide. So he was kind of uh, um, in deep emotional, well, we had deep emotional talks yeah. about everything. And um, we, we had a New Year's Eve con a concert and then one day we, we started to play and this was the starting point. And then uh, he came along with some lyrics and I thought, you know, the, those lyrics are great. And he started to write English lyrics that, hey man, this is bullshit. You know, this is so deep, let's do it in German. Yeah. Let's do it dreist. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, the, the band has some deep uh, meaning stuff and some funny stuff. We have a, we had a, we had a song is Warum wollen alle geilen Weiber immer nur reden mit mir? Which is, you know, uh, why do all the hot women only want to talk with me? <laughs> and um, yeah, it's a CC top riff of uh, kind of thing. We had fun. We had fun. 
uh, yeah. Participant is, is kind of, um, it has its face, we are still friends. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't have the time to do all the projects and so things uh, changed a bit. But we are still friends and you never know. <laughs> yeah, when was the last activity with, with that band? Oh, I think it was like two years ago in a pub where somebody said, hey, I want to hear the old stuff again. The problem is we do have local fans and the band never managed to be in a way um, um, att attracting too big of an audience. Yeah. So my other projects draw in more people and then it's hard if, you, if I play clubs to tell, uh, hey, Thomas is playing, but he's only getting whatever, 80 people. And with the other project, I get twice as many or yeah. three times as many. And then it's like, how much can we pay him? And uh, I hate this because my heart, I'm still behind every project I've ever done. Um, and I would be happy to play Dreist songs again with them. But it's, it's like if I do that, you know, then some people go and like, oh, yeah, I, it, it, it got difficult in a way. When we have a special um, occasion, I go for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe we answer a few questions because um, time is flying. Yeah, sure. Let's do yeah. it. So this first one is from Alex Guitar Fan and it's about guitar tone. He says, hi, Thomas, please. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your tones on the album Electric Gallery? It's one of his favorite guitar albums. Okay. It is this particular guitar, it is that particular amp, which is on now. And it is using a few more critical ingredients. One thing is an EMT 140 reverb plate. The real deal original plate reverb. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the mechanical thing that is as huge as a table tennis uh, kind of thing that takes four people to move <laughs> and that is critical. And I recorded Electric Gallery with this amp, similar settings like always, and a speaker um, in my 4x12, which was not the one that I usually use, or maybe it was, but at a different position. So, and that's it. And the, 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 the plate reverb is the secret. I show you, but I think my guitar got a little bit out of tune. Actually, would there be any modern plate reverb pedals that you could recommend maybe to Alex and others that could replicate those, those yeah. sounds? Yeah, um, the, those, those plate reverbs are pretty good in some digital uh, pedals. I actually have one from Digitech, well, uh, it's probably downstairs. Maybe it's here, let me see. Uh, here it is. I oh, know that's the looper, but anyway, from the same series, uh, which is the hardwired series from, is it Digitech? Yeah, Digitech. Um, this pedal, they have, a, they have a pedal which is called Reverb something, looks the same, mm -hmm. and they have the lexicon chip inside. Uh -huh. So they have a proper because it was Harman Group, Harman bought Lexicon and Digitech and yeah. them all and now sold it to some car manufacturer and it's all not available anymore. You know, the companies die because of people who want to make too much money. Yeah. Anyway, so this from the hardware side, there is, there is a reverb pedal and that has a beautiful plate reverb. It's not 100% the real deal, but it's pretty good. Let me show you, this is now, let me show you on the amp one. So this is, maybe you know that song. echo now mm -hmm. and now I put in the reverb from the amp one listen to the difference this is already going in this kind of direction yeah. Thank you. 
without a reverb you know it's it's it is this kind of uh, yeah it, it's an element that is important yeah okay uh, that's yeah, the electric gallery move question. on to the next one yeah. Stefan Mandel Stefan yeah. has a question about bending when you bend up a whole tone on the 13th fret on the E string do you keep the fingernail below or above the B string Stefan is having trouble with secondary noises coming from it Oh, I love the secondary noises. <laughs> uh, I okay. make a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If, if you can control it. Okay. He's talking about the. Um, I need to read the thread, like a six, a, a thirteenth thread. So that's that's what he's do, doing. Ah. Okay. No. I. It's it's definitely above it. It. I and I actually cut the nades today, which I usually don't do. <laughs> um, sometimes I forget about that, um, and I have too long nails. But uh, this is. I control the whole thing with my flesh. So, so the finger... But here's the secondary note, you know, this is like the... That whole thing, having like two notes at the same time, is so beautiful. I learned that from Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, mm -hmm. when, uh, you know, uh, B minor again. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. So watching from this position, as I was, the fingernail is always above. Yeah. And I guess you're using the rest of the fingers to mute the other strings. And yeah, that yeah. Is I mean, stopping the other sound. So, so for me, it's like <clears throat> if I bend the string. Everything else is muted. But sometimes, you know, I like to have the second note. You know, you know. Or, yeah. yeah, it can be beautiful. <laughs> Dreist. Okay. Uh, Jimmy, who just started watching, I guess, says, "What kind of picks are you using?" Well, I use. He sh he should skip back into the into the previous parts because yeah. we talked about this, but this quickly. Is, this is the one. This is the this is the Blackmore style pick, which is um, yeah which is home base, somebody told me the, the name is, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that, that's what I'm using. And yeah. That, that's, yeah, killer. Okay, next question. Yeah, yeah this is from Krena Chilku Guitar. I hope I'm saying your name right, Krena. Will there ever be a Blue Amp in future that will be based around any other kinds of amps, for example, a Vox or a Dumble, rather than a Marshall? Yeah, I mean, um, the M1 already is based on more than just the Marshall, but I mean, I'm talk, uh, talking Marshall so much because I played so many Marshall amps and this particular Marshall in a band for a decade maybe, or even longer. And so I'm, I'm, this is like my reference point. Yeah. But I have a ton of Fender amps next door, and this is what's going on on the clean channel. Mm -hmm. And I do have some high gain amps, which is uh, on the modern amps. If he's talking about Vox, I do have a nice 63 Vox, I guess. We had a, a full episode on this one and also a being with the M1. So we are already in the Vox territory. We are not in the Dumble territory yet, yeah. but um, our future product, the MX, will be all of them. It will be all of those amps and more, I and guess. And more, yeah. But we do need to get a Dumble in for you to... A, B again. If we hey guys, can find if, one around here, does yeah, anyone have one? Here, this is for the community. If you have a good dumble, I know where they are. They are in Nashville. There's Carter's Music, and they have they have all the most expensive dumbles on the planet. They have five or six of them, but it's too far. If somebody has a dumble in Germany, give me a call. I, I visit you. We have some coffee. I bring you tea, whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, you can get a dumble in our future product. Yeah. 
And just as a final point, I would say to Cronar as well, watch the episode where Thomas ABs the amp one against the box amp. Yeah. You will see that even though the amp one is not based on that amp, it can sound exactly like yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's so So it close. is a box amp too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It can do the boxy drops very good. Exactly, yeah. There is a question, a question here in German from, from Mario Tomsener. I, I won't read it in German, I'll just translate it. He said, can you just explain the trick, how you get these awesome overtones from the headstock from the Strat there? Please okay. show him how you do that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, in, in Deutsch, uh, zeig mir mal die Tricks wie die Overtöne. So. Um, yeah. so, Richard could read German, translate it, and then talk English. Okay, so, you know, I mean, yeah, very, very good. Um, so, <laughs> here, here's the stuff. Uh, one thing is using the nail and then kind of um, doing this kind of nail noise. But at the same time, I, I use uh, the Vemi bar, like I put on some volume and then I put the Vemi bar down and then I um, hit the string with the nail and then I release the Vemi bar, which is this. So, and then the other trick is I, I brush across the strings and I focus on this G string, which goes like this. So I can do it on individual strings, like this, or just this one, or the whole thing. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah. And sometimes I even do it with the volume control at the same time. I can blend it in, like hold it down. Yeah. Hey, it's my trick for decades. Yeah. And, and the, the more I get bored on stage and do shit like that. <laughs> Many happy hours for you practicing that, breaking nails, I guess, oh, yeah. learning how to do it. I had some issues with breaking nails on that too, but now I know how to do it without it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Mick Rose did says, uh, no, Mick Rose, sorry, says, did you ever use an attenuator to bring your plexi down to bedroom volume levels? And if so, which one would be your first pick? Okay, here is a, a, a story we have to go into detail one day. I'm the reason why there is a Marshall SE100 <laughs> because a friend of mine saw me playing this Marshall and he became the German product manager of Marshall at Music Meyer. Music Meyer probably has been the biggest Marshall uh, distributor uh, on the planet back in those days. And he could see me with that plexi suffering. And we, you know, one day, he turned the whole thing in another way. He saw, man, maybe we should make a reissue of the old M's. We all know this was like in the 90s, this was me playing with Dreist and this guy being in the audience, being my friend. And Jim Marshall didn't want to do that. And this guy was clever because he was a businessman. He simply placed an order that Jim Marshall could not refuse. <laughs> he ordered, I don't know, hundreds thousands of these marshals and power soaks and they, he created test stations for the music stores which were like huge racks with 200 watts 250 watts and four se 100 power soaks here we go and you know how many of these can you sell in germany hundreds which makes four hundreds you know i i think he played maybe an order about two one two thousand power soaks and uh, you know a, a fair amount of amps so this came along and that's the product that i was using later on <laughs> yeah <laughs> any others that you would recommend more modern ones that you know of or um yeah i mean later marshall did the power break later yeah. um uh, oh, there's so many out now um i have a a personal I wouldn't say issue, but um, I noticed that when you damp a speaker with a power soak, you lose some of the aliveness. Because uh, the power amp of the amplifier of the Marshall or whatever wants to see the, the natural speaker because there's a current feedback and this is blah, blah, blah. It, the best thing is, is if there is no resistor dampening like that. And 
a power soak is a resistor mm. and it, they try to compensate it with like big other components to get the base resonance going and the high end loss to keep that more alive blah 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 but it's always um, emulation and it's never the real deal so if you only deduct the volume a little bit it, it's it's not a problem for me but if you go at lower levels most of them do sound dull there are air brake or whatever they're called i lost interest in the whole thing because the m1 can do the whole thing without any loss and that's you know that's the real the, i can reduce the power down to seven watts and it's exactly the same because there is no resistance in between it's yeah. just a seven watt amp that breaks up and and so i don't need it yeah yeah well, there you go. Uh, yeah. There's the answer. And one. <laughs> Sven Becker says, Hey, Thomas, is there a scenario where you use compressors? And if so, could you recommend a compressor pedal? Sure. I have a compressor pedal over there, which is this little fellow here. Um, this is, is it called a yellow comp? It's, well, it's, it is a yellow compressor <laughs> by Diamond, or Diamond Comp is it's the name. And... Um, I use compressors for two kind of sounds. One sound is the sound of David Gilmour, um, which means more compression, less drive. And I use that pedal in front of the clean channel. And then I, I have it either clean or I have it like highly compressed, um, slightly overdriven, mm -hmm. another brick in the wall kind of thing, which I love. Um, yeah, so, and by the way, this pedal is the old school design that they are now available in, 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 in smaller formats. Yeah. And they have been copied by Fender. They used to be green, but I think they are not produced anymore under the name Fender. It was some Chinese uh, manufacturing, also for Moore. So the Moore one, this one, and the Fender one are exactly the same schematics, just different housings. Mm -hmm. And I think I have a, a Moore one on my pedal board. And the Moore one is probably what fifty euros or something yeah, like that. Yeah, so I mean very, it's very, very yeah. affordable. Yeah. yeah. And this is this is where it all comes from, and that's that's one that I like. I mean, I like other compressors as well, but that's the one that has been on my board for many years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jeroen Hoffmans, again, apologies for the name there, says, Hi Thomas, what is the maximum length of a speaker cable if you use the Amp 1 or the Iridium in front of you and a cabinet behind you on a big stage? I have, my usual length is, uh, what is it, 6 meters something about this or, or maybe even longer. Um, but that's not an issue, you can have a, a 10, 20 meter cable if it's good quality. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, w what's the reason for putting your speaker 20 meters away? <laughs> the latency of the, 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 the sound traveling is already too much. Um, so place your speaker behind you, where mm -hmm. you or uh, wherever it's, it is not too close, not too far. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, best is, um, yeah, five, six meters. Um, that's that's a regular stage setup. Yeah. If you need more, you know, I have I have studio setup where it goes through the whole house. I use thicker cables, and happy days. Yeah. Works. Okay. Good. Uh, Krenar's back. He says yes. He attended the Academy of Tone last year in Innsbruck, and yes, the amp one really could sound just like a Vox at times. <laughs> yeah. Really great product. Thanks. Happy yeah. times. Capix Studios. Oh, we have a YouTuber in the house. Hey, Vlad, how you doing? Uh. He says, does the Amp 1 need to be plugged into a cabinet or can he run the Amp 1 into, for example, an IR loader? Well, the Amp 1 does not need a load, so you can go straight, even from the speaker out, into an IR loader. Some IR loaders, or most IR loaders, have a speaker level input. And it's simply like a divider uh, you know, like a, a voltage divider that brings down the level because there's like 30, 40, 50 watt, uh, volts on the output, which is not suitable for a line input or a microphone input. Yeah. Um, you, you might fry some of the components <laughs> at the input <laughs> stage. But if you have this kind of little divider built into your 
Cap M or you know torpedo whatever, um, that's fine. And if you don't have a divider, there are uh, the I boxes that have, and I would recommend the passive ones that only have a transformer that have a, uh, a like a minus 20, minus 30 dB switch. And that kind of switch is a divider. Mm -hmm. I do have one maybe somewhere here. Yeah. I don't <laughs> see it now. But anyway, we, I, I, and it works beautifully. Okay. Very good. There's your answer, Vlad. Uh, we have a question from Loden, OS, or whatever the name is. Servus, hello. He says, could you talk a little bit about your speed bursts, please? What is a speed burst? I don't know. I guess it's when you play fast. really fast for really short periods of time. Okay, if that's a speed burst. Nope, that's right. Okay. okay, there's a little Aldi Miola influence. So as you can hear, there is a lot of attack going on. It's not so much uh, Tom Quayle legato style, even though I love the guy, you know. Mm -hmm. But this, I mean, this with this kind of tone that I or my, my setup, Tom would be lost. We actually played on the same stage, and when he heard me drench my sound, you know, he was deeply impressed. Man, you know, I love what he's doing, but he actually said. There's something about the stuff that you do as well, because bleh, I was, <laughs> you know, and and the same I do. I do with the. This is a Ingvi. Ah, again. Something like that. You know, the thing I learned at Reist playing live is you have to have a start and an end. And in between, try to keep it in time. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing I learned is it's not a mistake if you do it twice. Exactly. You um, know, that's, so. yeah. Um, I do some kind of economy picking, but I do pick a lot of notes because... I grew up on this kind of little muddy sound where I have to dig in to get my clear attack. So that's that. That's what I developed as, yeah. as my style as well. Mm. So if you give me an acoustic guitar, I'm suffering, but I can do it. I know many people who can't. I still can do it. I never play acoustic because I think I, electric guitar is so, so much cooler. Um, but actually, there are a few uh, concerts with Dreist where we played acoustic, and I I listened the other day and thought, man, little Aldi Miola in the house. Yeah. You know, I was like, mm, I didn't know that I could do that. Actually, well, anyway, but it, it is it is here with the uh, up down stroke kind of. Yeah, and players like Aldi Miola and Ingvi. Ingvi are the ones to yeah. practice from. Yeah, yeah. Ingvi is 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 a is a very economy uh, picking. Uh, I mean, he's got his incredible, incredible. I mean, but what I like ab about him is that he moves only very little, so he's super efficient, mm. and this makes him so fast. Yeah, and for me, it's like um, I'm. I taught myself to dig in a bit harder from my vintage background tone, and therefore I'm not as fast as Ingvi. Yeah. Who cares? <laughs> fast <laughs> enough to impress you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we got a few more. Uh, William Lee says, Thomas, I have one question to ask about the Iridium One, the Iridium Edition Amp One. Yeah. Is this amp suitable for power metal? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, I designed the black here, is it on the top of the Marshall? The, the, the iridium is designed for anything hard, I would say, and um, I'm not a super metal expert because there's so many different genres in metal already. Metal, power metal, speed metal, stoner metal, or metal metal. And I had a, a, another nice story I have to tell you. Um, I, I met uh, the, uh, the Accept guitar player the other day, and he's like... A, a, 
he's also a metal player, like more vintage metal or whatever that is. And he played the vintage channel. And when he tested the amp, he put the master on 10. And I tell you, I play loud, but I was trying to hide behind the 4x12. <laughs> this thing is so loud. I mean, it physically, I, I can feel the pressure in my eyes. You know, my, my, my sight was like... <laughs> and the guy was totally happy, you know. Oh, this is tight, yeah. <laughs> you know, so this, yeah, impressive. It, it's definitely metal suitable. So power metal, absolutely yeah. no problem. No problem. Okay, here's a question from someone called Prewar who says, does a ceramic capacitor have a directional effect? Is it trial and error? Curious. I'd huh? heard the same. I love all the minor tweaks. Thank you. Actually, um, if I talk to my friend Andreas Klopmann, who is the pickup guru in like my world, and there's others, no problem, but I know this guy for 25 years or longer. And yes, try them both ways. And then decide which direction you like better. I, I, I don't think there's a rule, but simply try it and whatever is better do it some people even hear the direction of the, the guitar cable and i'm honest i do too but here comes the other point mm -hmm. sometimes you simply have to play forget about all this esoteric <laughs> bullshit <laughs> but when you are in the mode for me there's like two modes one mode is practicing or it is like i do care about tones and i dig in stuff and I spend hours getting bigger, bigger ears and trying stuff and flip the, the capacitor around and whatever, do all that stuff. Then you achieve a result, preserve the result and then forget about it. Start to play again. Otherwise you spend your whole life never playing, just uh, twiddling. And, and that's the thing here. Try it, simply try it. And sometimes it even depends on the component itself. I mean, I have vintage guitars and I collect vintage capacitors and who knows what, why they do it different things, different ways and whatever. I just try yeah. and then and if I have no time, I don't try <laughs> and it works too. Yeah. Yeah. So just do it. Just yeah. play. That's the answer. And I yeah. think um, we have what is probably a, a final question. It's from our production team who say, can they go home? It's 10 o'clock at night here. <laughs> so I think we probably, yeah. uh, we have come kind of to the end of the questions. Yeah. There are still more coming in. Yeah. There are so many, and I guess we can't answer them all now. So everybody Let who's asked a question, we will transfer it and answer it in the next live stream. Absolutely. You will get to all of these. We're sorry that we couldn't get to them now, but we will yeah. get to everything if we can. Yeah. Um, but I think at this point, we will have to say Thomas has given us four or five extra special <laughs> bonus tips, yeah. the secrets behind his sounds. Very quickly, just to go through them again, it was the Plexi, the 69 Plexi. It was the special plectrums that yeah. you use there. It was the Replex pedal. It was the here. capacitor. It was the special capacitor and the, the Trouble Mika. Bleed yeah. mod. And it was the playing itself, the dynamics and the way you attack the guitar. So take those five points, yeah. go away, practice and, and get better. Yeah, and here's something, um, while thinking about what were these points, I was digging into my history and I found so many things in my history that we have to make future episodes about the phases I went through. Because I found books, uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't, uh, oh, that's a guitar. That's just a 61 Strat that's falling. <laughs> no one <laughs> Who cares. cares? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I found, I found so cool stuff. Um, you know, me back in those days, we will have, here, uh, I show it here, da, da, da. Um, and there's um, Tony Carey, um, killer um, organ player, he used to be in Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, and I'm on his CD, you see the one shirt, which is unmistakable, <laughs> so, and the one shirt is always a good sign that I play the M1, mm -hmm. because it didn't, exist before <laughs> so um, I'm thinking about maybe next or over ne whenever episode to go into my rack system that I played once um, I found it somewhere in the what is it cellar in the mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and um, it's half half working half ripped off 
apart. Um, I, I, I probably get that working again one day. And, you know, there's, there's so much uh, funny things. <laughs> this this is, is the one I'm waiting for to show you. Because this, this was me being a producer for... Where is the camera? Here. Can you read this? Ah, nobody can read this. The camera can't. Maybe this one here. I mean, this is just... So, this is Aloha Records. Aloha Records. And Thomas Blue, the record producer. So, there's a total other thing. And this was the act that I was producing to Hawaii. Two Hawaiians. You know, big guys. A, a, a couple doing great dance music and I was actually instructing them how to dance. This was about the weirdest thing I've ever done. So there's more crazy stuff to come, also on guitar tones, but mm -hmm. when I was looking at my, you know, um, CD collection from the past, I found things like, like, I was so amused. I have to share this with you guys because you <laughs> never would think that I've done stuff like that. And there must be some old VHS tapes where I was shooting the video with Max Spielberg, which is probably the son of Sp Steven Spielberg. I found out later. This is so crazy. <laughs> I will. I have to, to check this up. It might take a while because I have to find the VHS tapes, but I know they do exist somewhere in some box. And then... Yeah, you hear it. Anyway, I think uh, it's um, yeah, it's time to to let you go, guys go. Thanks for joining in, um, and yeah, welcome, Mr. Richard Morgan at, at Blue Guitar. Um, the first day when he came, he brought a beautiful cake that he I made. Did. Yeah, that he made himself. Um, a very tasty one too. Yeah, the cake won. Um, so. The Blue Guitar team has a new face that you already know. And um, I'm looking forward for more to come with you. And yeah, take care, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>